So, um, they're all, uh, both here and at home watching the live stream, would all like to warmly welcome you to uh, Professor Etem Alem's lecture, The Ottoman Empire and Turkey, a great place to visit, a hard place to live. Also on behalf of the co-organizers, Professor Ur Unger and Dr. Husina Lul of the University of Amsterdam. Uh, my name is Enno Maasen. I'm lecturer in history at Utrecht University, and I will moderate today's event. And this lecture is the first keynote uh, lecture of the International Conference Narrating Exile in and Between Europe, the Ottoman Empire and Modern Turkey, of the Turkey Studies Network in the Low Countries, and also of the Amsterdam Center for European Studies. Just a very little bit of background information on the Turkey Studies Network in the Low Countries. Our network was set up in 2020, so last year, as a place for academics working on Turkey, uh, the Ottoman Empire, and the post-Ottoman region. Um, based in the Benelux, and we also wanted to create a uh, public platform for discussing a variety of topics related to Turkey between academia and society. Uh, and that's also the scope uh, sort of in which this conference and this keynote lecture operates. <clears throat> now, it is my great pleasure and privilege now to invite um, in a bit, uh, Professor Etem Aldam, who is Professor of History at Boğaziçi University in Istanbul and Professor to the International Chair in Turkish and Ottoman History at the Collège de France in Paris. Uh, in Paris. And Professor Eldam is one of the most distinguished and critical voices in the field of Ottoman and Turkey's history and he has published extensively on Levant trade, funerary, uh, epigraphy, Istanbul, the Ottoman Bank, the history of archaeology in the Ottoman lands, Ottoman first-person narratives, Ottoman photography and diplomacy. He is also one of the few voices in the field whose perspective transcends traditional chronologies from early modern to modern history. And I therefore think that I speak for many of us when I say um, that his work has been and is a great inspiration and point of reference. He is, however, also one of the most creative and witty public speakers that I know. Uh, whose critical voice inter <laughs> intertwines, uh, intertwines with a true mastery of irony. And to give you an example, I would like to plagiarize uh, one of your jokes, dear Etam, um, since, as you know, in this country, we have a habit of appropriating things that are not ours. So, Professor Aldam once uh, discussed how he would avoid describing himself as a historian during taxi rides, since that would always lead to considerable frustration on his part, since everyone and his uncle has an opinion on history in Turkey, but of course also elsewhere. And it shows how uh, these conversations would show how his profession as a historian is effectively being hijacked by nationalist agendas. When a specific taxi driver, for instance, learned that he was a historian, the driver asked him why Sultan Suleiman died. And of old age, Professor Eldam replied, no, he was poisoned. Poisoned, but why? Because otherwise they would not have been able to stop him. So now when asked, Professor Eldam sometimes says he is a sociologist, which is a white lie that saves him many headaches and frustration. Today, Professor Eldam will talk to us about the peculiar process that is unfolding nowadays in Turkey, where according to surveys, two-thirds of its youth wants to leave the country, a potential outcome of a process that Professor Eldam will historicize in his lecture and contrast with another current of Turkey as a place of arrival of men and women who saw temporary or permanent residence in, quote-unquote, Turkey, for reasons ranging from curiosity and business to political asylum and outright survival. Following Professor Eldam's uh, lecture, there will be room for questions, of course, also from you, from the audience. Professor Eldam, dear Etam, thank you so much for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Enno. By the way, that's uh, what you just quoted was not a joke. It was a real, an anecdote, which doesn't mean it's a lie. But, um, okay, uh, I'll, I'll start with um, stories of privilege and pleasure, because it's a great privilege and a true pleasure to have been asked to deliver a keynote address on the occasion of this uh, conference on, quote-unquote, narrating exile in and between Europe and the Ottoman Empire, modern Turkey. If a title is that long, you know there's a problem. Uh, 
organized by the Turkey Studies Network in the Low Countries and the Amsterdam, the underworld, uh, we heard this this morning, uh, the Low Countries and the Amsterdam Center for European Studies at the University of Amsterdam. I wish to thank the organizer for this uh, invitation. Most particularly, allow me to extend my warmest thanks to the triumvirate uh, of Enno Maasen, uh, Hussein Alul behind, and Ur Umit uh, Unger, whom I just saw a while ago, who have triple handedly set up the whole event from its scholarly content to its logistic details. Years ago, Actually, I have to be honest, decades ago, when I lived in Tehran, in Iran, as an expat teenager and dip rat, AFRTS was the only television channel I could watch and understand. Let me spell it out for you. AFRTS was the acronym for American Forces Radio and Television Service. You may have guessed from this that I am talking of pre-revolutionary Iran. That's how old I am. There was a recurring ad on AFRTS which targeted its actual audience to encourage them to move to one or another state in the US once their service uh, time would come to an end. Of course, the states advertised were not New York or California. Um, uh, but rather some more obscure and admittedly less attractive destinations. The motto was always the same. Oklahoma, or Alabama, or New Mexico, or Oregon. A great, uh, a nice place to visit, a great place to live. So if you ever wondered, this is what inspired the title of this presentation. Obviously the context is quite different. But for whatever reason, and I'm not excluding senile nostalgia, this phrase had somehow stuck in my mind. And it immediately popped up when I started to think about this lecture. Yet my take was at the reverse of the logic behind the American message of the 1970s. Instead of a crescendo from a nice place to visit to a great place to live, my argument was based on the contrast and opposition between the Ottoman lands and Turkey as an attractive destination for visitors and a difficult place to live for its own subjects or citizens. I believe this contrast sums up one of the dominant contradictions of demographic and human flows between these lands and the rest of the world. A pole of attraction for so many visitors and temporary residents, it remains a place where a prolonged, let alone permanent, settlement is perceived with anxiety and often triggers a feeling of being trapped. Interestingly, the present and very recent past has witnessed a very considerable rise in phenomena uh, uh, what is likely to link to one form or another of exile. Intuitively, I believe that the proportion of Ottoman subjects and Turkish citizens who may have experienced one form or another of exile is high. One could musingly adapt the Quranic saying that everyone will taste death and claim that every Ottoman slash Turk has tasted or will taste exile. However, I am not one of them. True, my grandmother was exiled for almost 30 years. Uh, my mother was born in exile and remained so for almost 15 years. Nevertheless, nevertheless I was spared any feeling that comes even close to the notion of exile however loosely we may use it. In fact, I am part of a happy minority of people who are mobile and fluid enough, and I will avoid saying cosmopolitan so you don't really hate me that much, to arrogantly brag about the joys of feeding a stranger everywhere, in, even at home. As I noted in my abstract, uh, polls in Turkey today reveal that a very strong proportion of the young generation, up to two-thirds apparently, dreams of leaving the country, targeting the West in its broadest sense. This is a phenomenon the like of which has not been seen in decades. Even the flight from oppression and incarceration of leftist 
and Kurdish activists in the 1970s and after the 1980 military coup could not come close to such a massive potential of human loss if it were to be realized. It may some, somewhat be likened to the massive wave of Turks leaving their country to become Gastarbeiters in Germany and later in other Western European countries, including the Netherlands, uh, which started exactly 60 years uh, ago, but with a major difference. This labor-based economic exile was dominantly defined by a clear pull factor, while today's intent seems to be motivated by a push factor, which cannot be reduced to a precise political or economic nature. A general feeling of hopelessness, a belief that they have no future in their country, seems to be the broadest common denominator behind these intentions, across a very wide political and socioeconomic spectrum. Generational is probably the best label that one could come up with to characterize the, the dominant feature of this trend. In a sense, this is what makes it all the more ter terrifying by its implication of desperation that jeopardizes the very future of the country. This uh, self-exile in the making is not the AKP and Erdogan's only contribution to Turkey's reconnecting with long-forgotten notions of e exile and banishment. The attempted and failed coup of July 2016 by their former Gulenist allies has triggered a backlash of unprecedented proportions which targeted tens, if not hundreds of thousands of citizens suspected of collusion and connections with or simply sympathy for the movement. Thousands were arrested, incarcerated, or simply derived of their jobs and means of livelihood through a series of arbitrary measures, thus sending those who could escape into exile, much like their alleged leader, Fethullah Gulen, who lives in self-imposed exile and seclusion in the United States since 1999. The rise of a personalized and authoritarian regime in the past half decade has also contributed to the emergence of a new type of political exile, that of, quote unquote, disappearance of bureaucrats and politicians discarded by the system. One striking example is that of Erdogan's own son-in-law, Berat Albayrak, who after a disastrous term at the helm of the economy, simply vanished into thin air, a bit like dismissed Soviet officials in the past. We have no reason to worry about his fate. He just chose, probably following strong familial advice, to withdraw from the political scene, perhaps in the hope of making a comeback in, if the circumstances were to change in his favor. A much more pathetic example is that of Mirih Bulu, the apparatchik uh, who, um, uh, you know probably, who was placed at the head of the attack on Boazici University, my university, at the very beginning of this year. Rejected by the university, he was supposed to conquer. Accused of plagiarism, he turned out to be a liability and was simply discarded six months later, only to be replaced by an insider who was willing to carry out the government's plan of dismantlement and conquest. Nobody knows what happened to poor Bulu, who simply vanished, but with much less panache than al -Bayrak. Rumor has it that he is teaching in a Macedonian university, living a double exile outside the country and in total oblivion. Interestingly, Turkey today is not just losing or risking to lose uh, what is probably the most precious component of its population. It has also become a land of refuge for millions of individuals fleeing war and instability in the region. The Syrian refugees constitute the most conspicuous layer of this incoming wave of exiles, recently topped by an uncontrolled flow of men, the stress on gender is meaningful, from Afghanistan following the Taliban takeover. It had been a very long time since this part of the globe had become a haven for a sizable population fleeing war and oppression. 
I am excluding the wave of immigration caused by the dismantling of the Ottoman Empire or its aftershocks, where the incoming population were, uh, populations were in one way or another viewed as being religiously, ethnically, or culturally close to the core population. This was the case of the Muslim populations fleeing the lands lost in the Balkans after 1878 and Crete at the turn of the century, of those exchanged against Anatolian Greeks in 1924, or of the Turks, quote unquote, who were allowed to leave Yugoslavia and Bulgaria during the Cold War. The Syrian refugees are somewhere in the middle not as distant as the Poles or the Hungarians who fled the repressive backlash of 1848 or 49, but certainly not as close as the Balkan Turks driven from their lands by the Russian advance. Perhaps a reasonable comparison would be the massive exodus of tribes from the Caucasus fleeing Russian expansion after the Crimean War. Syrian immigration has revealed all the ambiguities inherent to Turkish politics and culture with respect to incoming aliens. On the one hand, one can easily claim that Turkey has fared better than Europe, particularly some member countries, in accepting huge numbers of refugees, more than half of the entire displaced population of Syria. The conditions for the settlement were far from ideal, but the natural porosity and inefficiency of the system soon compensated for that by enabling a great majority to reach the major urban centers, thus starting a process of integration, albeit of a precarious nature. True, behind the humanitarian action lie a number of rather cynical calculations, starting with the European Union's desire to use Turkey as a buffer to manage the risk of direct immigration. Turkey, on its side, has shown great enthusiasm um, um, for the financial scheme but uh, put forward by the uh, European Union as a compensation for this role, but the government has also had no scruples about using the matter for political leverage, especially by threatening to push refugees into the European Union. The darker side of immigration could also be witnessed in society where Syrians were often exploited as underpaid labor by businesses that took advantage of their vulnerable status. More importantly, however, the severe economic recession of the past few years has triggered numerous acts and reactions of racism and exclusion across the political spectrum, revealing to what extent socioeconomic discrimination and xenophobia ran deep in Turkish society and culture, providing a disturbing sense of cohesion in an otherwise highly polarized environment. Yet I think that if we are to talk about exile to or from the Ottoman Empire and Turkey in a historical context, it seems that we are faced with two dominant and opposite trends, based on the most traditional identities one can think of, religion. Muslims in, non-Muslims out. The steady inflow of Muslims parallels the erosion of the empire along the long 19th century. From the Mauryan or Moriot, refugees in the 1820s to the Thracian Muslims um, a century later, hundreds of thousands of Muslims took refuge from the lost provinces of the empire, mostly in Anatolia, with particularly dramatic peaks after the defeats of 1878 and 1913. To these, one should add those populations which, although not formally subjected to Ottoman rule, chose to migrate to the Ottoman lands due to the annexation of their lands by rival powers, especially Russia, such as the Crimean Tatars in the 1780s or the tribes of the Caucasus in the 1860s. The Republic inherited a much smaller scale version of this phenomenon when some remaining groups of Balkan Muslims chose to migrate from communist ruled Albania, Yugoslavia, and, uh, or Bulgaria to Turkey. The chronology of the migration of non-Muslim populations from the empire overlaps to a large extent with the influx of Muslims uh, I have just uh, described. Of course, one could always go back to the earliest centuries of the empire and talk, for example, of the Greek exodus from Constantinople after its fall, 
which Republican historiography, I love that, uh, pointing at Byzantine scholars taking refuge in Italy, went so far as presenting this as the Turkish contribution to the Renaissance. The existence throughout the early modern period of Greek communities uh, in Rome, Venice, Vienna, Marseille, or Amsterdam attests to a flow, or rather a trickling, of Orthodox subjects from the empire to certain parts of Europe. The same could be said of Armenians, whose trading networks extending from India to Europe were particularly conducive to migration, as was the oppression faced by the Armenian Catholics who took refuge in Venice and in Vienna in the 18th century. Nevertheless, it was in the 19th century, particularly in its second half, that the movement took on truly massive proportions. The repression of the Greek insurrection resulted in minor flights, such as those of some families from Chios, and similar examples can be found during the following decades. But it's really during the Hamidian period in the 1890s and 1900s that massive movements were witnessed among two major groups, Armenians and Christian Arabs, fleeing disastrous economic conditions and, in the case of the, lat of the former, the Armenians, outright persecution and massacres. As in the case of Muslim immigration, the Republic inherited to a large extent this pattern, targeting non-Muslim populations, which did not fit in the state's uh, and the majority's vision of the Turkish nation. Together with Greece, it organized, and we heard about it just a minute ago, it organized the first population exchange, which set a precedent for many tragedies that were to follow throughout uh, uh, the world. The pogrom of 1955, followed by expulsions and tensions over Cyprus, have reduced the remaining Greek population in the country to near 1,500, probably. Jews, targeted by a wealth tax in 1942, left en masse after the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. The community stands today at a mere 15,000. A century after its demise, practically nothing of the Ottoman Empire's religious diversity remains in Turkey today. This is all the more ironic when one considers that the country which prides itself with being the only secular state in the Middle East is at the same time the most homogeneously Muslim country uh, in the region. Of course, one will always find exceptions to the rule, starting with the settlement of Iberian and later Italian Jews in the Ottoman lands after the Spanish Reconquista, or the settlement of European Jews in Palestine at the turn of the 20th century. One could also mention Charles XII um, of Sweden, uh, Comte de, de Bonneval, or more famously, the influx of post-1848 refugees from the Habsburg and Russian lands, provided we remember that most of them never intended to settle but had sought an asylum until they could reach a safe heaven, a haven uh, in Western Europe, like Lajos Kossuth and his companions. And then, of course, there are all those renegades, converts, engineers, officers, artists, scholars, like the German Jewish scientists in the early 1930s, who, for one reason or another, ended up in the Ottoman lands or Turkey for relatively long periods of time, sometimes for the rest of their lives. In the other direction, um, sorry. Oh. Oh, okay. Um, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I lost my, my line. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah. In the other direction, Muslims leaving or fleeing their land to settle abroad may be rare, but they exist. Mehmet II's uh, son, Jem, half exile, half hostage, dragged around Europe and the Mediterranean is an obvious early example that comes to mind. Much later, young Ottomans and young Turks, from Nam Kemal to Prince Sabahattin and from Ali Suavi to Ahmed Reza, can constitute a small but consistent sample of political exiles who broke the dominant pattern to seek refuge in uh, Western uh, capitals. And then, of course, there were the 145 states in exile to Malta in 1919 and 1920, and the 155 members of the Ottoman dynasty, and the 150 collaborators of the Ancien Regime who were exiled in 1924. Yet on both sides, these cases are consistent with what I said earlier. 
namely that they constitute exceptions to the general rule of Muslims in, non-Muslims out. It is only in the last decades that this rule may have been slightly altered, not by a sudden rush of non-Muslims to Turkey, but by significant departures of Turks from their homeland, especially as economic migrants. Of course, there is still, uh, there still is a major, major dimension of the question that is missing, that of internal exile. In fact, I would even claim that this is probably the most dramatic aspect of the question, and one that is almost inherent to the Ottoman Empire and to a certain extent to Turkey. Indeed, right from the very start, exile, deportation, banishment, re uh, relegation, relocation have been at the core of the Ottoman state's policy regarding subject populations. We know how deportations known as surgun were used to drain certain regions of unwanted elements, but most of all to repopulate others, as in the famous case of Constantinople after the conquest. We also know that recruitment for the army and bureaucracy relied greatly on the extraction of children from conquered populations through a system that was called defirme, or literally collection. The slave trade fed an incessant flow of men and women who were uprooted from their homeland in Africa or in the Caucasus to end up in the imperial palace and in the mansions and homes of individuals who could afford this commodity. Banishment, perhaps the form of exile that comes closest to the original Roman notion of exilium, was uh, practiced on a regular basis as a punishment for individuals who were accused of wrongdoings, but whose crime fell short of deserving uh, execution, or simply as a form of retirement for certain high-ranking officials. The latter measure was particularly frequent among palace eunuchs who were sent to Mecca and Medina at the end of their career, or among the women of a former sultan who were sent out from the new seraglio, what we know today as uh, Topkapı Palace, uh, to the old one, to end their lives in an exile of a mere two kilometers that must have felt like thousands of leagues away. The list could be extended even to include the great flight, Büyük Kaçkun, characterizing one particular aspect of the 17th century crisis, consisting of the flight of peasants from villages to inhospitable and inaccessible regions to escape a number of threats, from banditry to tax collectors. At any rate, it is clear that displacement at an individual or communal level seems to have been an endemic feature of the Ottoman Empire well into modernity. One could point at the reign of Abdul Hamid from 1876 to 1909 as a peculiarly fertile period for political exile, with such striking examples uh, ranging from Mithat Pasha, whose second banishment in 1881 was a commuted death sentence, which ended up being carried out unofficially in his prison of Taif, to scores of political opponents who were sent out uh, to the islands or to other remote provinces of the empire, sometimes with a local bureaucratic post, as in the case of Nam Kemal in uh, the archipelago, Tunal Hilmi in Madrid, or of the young Turks who ended up in the Libyan desert. After all, following his deposition, Abdul Hamid himself was exiled to Thessaloniki, and if he returned to Istanbul when the city fell, it was only to be relegated to the palace of Beylerbi. Yet, if there is one event that tragically re resonates with some of the practices of the earlier centuries of the empire, it is certainly the deportation of the Armenian population during the Great War. Indeed, we should not forget that what is known as the Armenian genocide from the perspective of its underlying intent and final results was initially planned and implemented as a deportation whose unprecedented violence found its rules in the deadly combination of an ancient practice with a modern ideology that viewed the very existence of this community, even deported as a threat to the survival of the state and of its newly redefined dominant nation, Mileta Hakime. Before the enormous diversity of the uh, phenomena and events I have referred to in this long historical panorama, one feels compelled to ask the question of whether they can really all be lumped under one broad category of exile. If we are to stick to a literal, quote-unquote, orthodox understanding of the word, the answer is obviously no. 
After all, a true exile, ostracism for the Greek. Uh, for the Greeks, um, ostracismos, I think, is a punishment, a capital one uh, for the Romans, decreed by the authority or voted by the community, whereby a member is banished from his or her land. Yet obviously, our present understanding of exile, while inclusive of the initial definition, is much broader and flexible. Clearly, our concern is not so much with the factor conducive to estrangement as it is with the fact that one has to leave one's home or land and is left in the situation of living in a foreign land or environment. In fact, even the notion of a forceful departure, of an obligation to leave, is often tempered by the inclusion of self-exile as a um, choice, triggered by the estimation of the cost and risks of staying. But sometimes, even independently of such push factors, uh, uh, push factors. In short, then, to use a cliche, we might be justified to say that exile is in the eyes of the beholder, or rather, in the feelings and thoughts of the exiled. One needs only to conduct a lexicographic search of synonyms to get a sense of the wide range of meanings and categories associated with the notion of exile. This is true of English, of course, but I shall limit myself to Turkish for purposes of consistency with our topic. Only one of these numerous words is really Turkish. Sürgün, which I mentioned already, the one that has best survived in the language today as a synonym for exile. Derived from the, ve the verb surmek, to drive, with a connotation of herding, it reflects best the sense of a forced displacement and was used to describe the deportations of the early period. The rest of the vocabulary is of Arabic origin, and some words such as istifaz, sebr, or ijla are oddities that, are, that one rarely sees outside of dictionaries. This leaves us with two major lexical groups. One derived from nefj, to banish, and the other from hij, to leave. An essential difference between the two is obvious. Nefj and its derivatives, menfi, an exiled person, menfa, a place of, uh, of exile, denote the punitive nature of the act and was commonly used in the 19th century to describe state-ordered political uh, exile. Hijr, on the contrary, as suggested by the Hijra of the Prophet Muhammad in, in 16, sorry, 622, focuses on the displacement itself with a very strong connotation of migration. Just a cursory glance at the Ottoman archives reveals how its main derivative, muhajir, a migrant or a refugee, emerged. First used in a neutral sense covering any migrant, it started to uh, taking up a new and collective meaning in the 18th century with a wave of migrants from Shirvan in Azerbaijan. By the end of the century, it acquired the sense of refugee with the Crimean uh, muhajir, followed by a deepened ses sense of despair once the Greek rebellion created a flow of refugees from the Maria and other lost territories. By the mid-century, it was the turn of the Caucasian tribes to acquire this status. A peak was reached after the Russo-Ottoman War of 77-78, so much so that the geographic reference that had until then accompanied every occurrence of the word was dropped, leaving the term muhajir alone to describe the hundreds of thousands of refugees that flocked the capital. Ironically, the same Arabic root was at the origin of another word that is today associated with the massive displacement of the Armenians after 1915, tehjir, literally meaning making leave, but used with much stronger connotation of deportation. I would like to add one last term, the noun and adjective garib, stranger, remarkable for its emotional connotation, which makes it interchangeable with poor and forsaken, and for its much more common substantive form, gurbet, best translated as homesickness, to the point that the popular Turkish term used for Gastarbeiter is gurbetçi, the, literally the one practicing or living homesickness. 
The reason I have added this last term is to introduce a sentimental and pathetic dimension of the matter, which is central to the very notion of separation so deeply embedded in our understanding of exile. While it is undeniable that there are happy exiles, and that the logic behind many of the forms of migration rests on the desire to leave misery and suffering behind and move into a better world, the idea of loss is practically inseparable of any account of exile, be it at a purely rhetorical level. This in turn brings me to what may indeed be the most challenging aspect of the subject that brings us together here, narrating exile. Of course, at one level, nothing could be simpler or more obviously uh, or uh, more obvious. For the reasons I have just listed, exile has always been one of the most attractive, not to say popular, themes in literature and in the arts. From Ovid and Cicero to the German Exilliteratur, poets and authors of all times have found in exile a source of inspiration, if not an urge to reveal their deepest feelings in the face of estrangement and loneliness. It would be an exaggeration to say that the Ottomans were no different, given the discrepancy of scale in their literary production. Nevertheless, a number of texts can be shown to belong to a literature of exile. The Vakat, the adventures of Jem Sultan during his exile in Europe in the 15th century. The writings of the 17th century Sufi Niazi Misri during his exile on the island of Lemnos. Izet Mollah's Mihnet Keshan, Those Who Suffer, written during his exile in Keshan in the 1820s. There's a pun there, but you know. Uh, yet it is with modernity that the phenomenon really took off. Under Abdulaziz and Abdul Hamid, two generations of young Turks went through some form of exile and left memoirs and accounts of their experience. Namu Kemal, Ahmed Mitat, Ebu Ziya, Tefik, Ismail, Safa, Hussein, Siret. The revolution of 1908 unleashed an avalanche, by Ottoman standards, of such memoirs, betraying an open competition for recognition by the new regime. They were followed by those who were sent into exile by the young Turks then those who returned from Malta, and finally those who were banished by the Kemalist regime. Uh, some were lucky enough to experience exile under two consecutive uh, regimes, the Refik Halit Karai, and I think Christine Fidio is going to talk about him tomorrow, was exiled to Anatolia by the Young Turks in 1913 and returned when they were expelled in 1918, but then paid the price of opposing the Kemalist movement by exiling himself to Syria and Lebanon, where he stayed until 1938. Each of these was the occasion to write a series of short stories uh, focusing on this, uh, these places of, of exile. There are, however, two sides to every coin. While there's no doubt that these narratives of exile provide us with an often fascinating insight into the lives and minds of these victims of exile, we should not forget that they also present a consistently skewed profile. Almost all of these authors are male, politically active, and motivated, inevitably self-conscious about what they chose to write or not to write in view of publication. Given the very loaded context of political exile, which was the case for the overwhelming majority of such authors, it is clear that several forms of self-fashioning were likely to influence their narrative, starting with an inevitable temptation to exaggerate their political role or their sufferings, or to suppress or marginalize aspects of their experience that they did not deem worthy of or compatible with the image they, wanted, they might have wanted to give of themselves. Of course, there are circumstances and formats that help reduce this drawback, starting with unpublished sources, such as diaries or, or correspondence. True, diaries are rare, but some of the men are known to have kept a sustained correspondence with their friends and family, some of which has survived to this day. One needs only to consult Fevzi Abdullah Tansel's remarkable work in the 1960s on Namuk Kemal's correspondence to get an idea of how informative such a documentation can be when treating such a subject. Nevertheless, however detailed the documentation, however intimate the writings, these still remain men. 
and in the overwhelming majority of cases, men of a certain standing, often self-important, endowed with the educational and intellectual skills needed to engage in a self-consciously modern act of narration or self-narration. The bias caused by gender, socioeconomic standing, political power is simply immense. What do we know about women, peasants, soldiers, slaves, landless refugees, convicts, in short, about the mass of ordinary individuals who made up the vast majority of people who were displaced against their will or migrated out of fear and desperation? How many first-hand personal accounts do we have and can we hope to find of Muslim refugees flooding the capital after the debacles of 1878 or 1913? How many women... Um, uh, how many women who were dragged into exile as wives or as daughters or as slaves were able to tell their story in a way that left a trace for posterity? It is undeniable that there is a strong correlation between the socioeconomic standing of individuals and their likelihood or ability to narrate their life story, for better or for worse. Can one not widen this observation to cover even the orally transmitted memory of past events? It has always struck me to what extent memories of a lost homeland acquire different levels of detail and precision between the descendants of Greeks who left their home in Anatolia to settle in Greece and those of Turks, or rather Muslims, who were forced to make the opposite journey from the Balkans to Anatolia. The former generally cherish the memory of their ancestral home down to the village, the street, and the house where their grand or great-grandparents had lived. The latter, the Turks, as far as I've seen, can rarely go beyond the name of a province, a nearby city, or even just the vaguest reference to Rumeli, Rumelia. I think it is significant that the exceptions on the Turkish side generally have to do with those areas, such as Crete or Yanina, where the Muslim population enjoyed a wealthier status, generally due to land ownership. If we apply all these observations to the question of exile and its narratives, it becomes clear that it is practically impossible to retrieve the voices, as we like to say, of most of the individuals concerned, unless they belong to a privileged minority possessing the material and intellectual means and motivation to leave a written trace of their ordeal, or if their plight ends up finding a strong moral and political mediation, as may have been the case with the survivors of the Armenian genocide or the Greek refugees from Anatolia, in ways that were never made available to Muslim refugees in 78, 1913, or 1924. Of course, one cannot dismiss all hopes of finding alternative sources or alternative ways of filling the gaps of our documentation. After all, let us not forget that feelings of exile end up popping up in all sorts of sources, especially anonymous and popular ones. Everyone in Turkey knows the song of Yemen, Yemen Turkusu, a lament that speaks of the sorrow and sufferings of conscript uh, posted uh, in this godforsaken uh, province of the empire. If anything, this is a meaningful reminder that military service, when it involves such distances and such long periods, amounted pretty much to an exile from which one lost hope of ever returning. Those who leave never return. I wonder why, says the famous song. I would like to conclude, however, with a personal take on the question of alternative and somewhat unexpected sources of exile by referring to my ongoing research on the memoirs and diaries of an Ottoman prince, Serahattin Efendi, the son of Sultan Murad V, who was deposed on grounds of insanity in 1876 and was then replaced on the throne by Abdul Hamid. The deposed sultan and his entire household, about a hundred persons, um, almost all women, were kept under custody in the palaces of Turan and Feriye for almost 30 years until Murad's death in 1904. This captivity amounted to an exile and a form of social death, which apparently triggered in young Serahattin, the prince, uh, he was 16 at the beginning of their cap captivity, the urge to do something extraordinary by Ottoman standards, that is to keep a diary, to write his memoirs, and to collect personal and family mementos in scrapbooks. 
thus creating a set of ego documents of unprecedented and still unequaled wealth and originality. Understandably, the young prince's writings are strongly imbued with feelings of frustration and despair. And if it does not come to his mind to call this an exile, it is probably because the theme of being subjected to injustice, Maslou Miet, conveyed much more powerfully the image he wanted to, uh, uh, wanted to give of their treatment at the hands of a tyrant, Zalim, but also because true exile was already a subpart of their ordeal when many of their slaves and servants were actually banished immediately after the, uh, their, their de deposition. Not the least interesting is the fact that on at least two occasions in his diary, the sight of the imperial yachts, Izzeddin and Fuat, in the Bosphorus made him comment that I'm kind of interpreting, there was exile in the air. A reminder of how visible the frequent banishments that were carried out to distant provinces of the empire were to the population. Yet the truly striking discovery I made while studying these documents was the way they revealed some aspects of one of the least known form of uprooting and exile still in practice at the time, that of female slavery. With the exception of himself and his son, Zeratin, the fallen sultan's household consisted almost exclusively of women and of half a dozen eunuchs. All these women, with the exception of Murad's and Zeratin's daughters, were of slave origin. Some of high standing, such as Murad's mother or his and Zeratin's wives, while the others constituted the workforce of the palace. Seratin's writings were predictably insistently focused on himself and on his father, but they inevitably contained a mass of information on some of these women. Much of this is difficult to use or even to comprehend given the degree of intimate knowledge that would be necessary to penetrate the logic of such a complex and hierarchized structure. Nevertheless, some are clear enough to allow for a straightforward analysis of their contents. I have selected two passages, both concerning Seratin Effendi's wives, which to my opinion shed light on the harsh realities of the life and career of a slave woman in an Ottoman palace. In one of these, he gives a short vita, like an obituary, of Dilavis Hanam, who had just died of tuberculosis. I'm quoting. She said her origins were Georgian or Laz. She was taken in before the age of two by a well-to-do family from Batumi, among whom she grew up in Istanbul. She recalled having been in Albania, in Syria, and in Batumi. Toward the end of 1874, she came to Istanbul with her mistress and was sold to Mahmoud Pasha. Siniha Sultan's husband. At our accession in 1876, she was given to the palace along with eight other fellow slaves and fell to my lot by chance. That's a career. Another passage consisted of the transcription of a letter he had sent to the parents of another of his wives, apparently to try to reassure her, his wife, as to their well-being. Again, I'm quoting. You will surely not have forgotten the name of Gülşen or Zategül. These ors are extremely important because the identities change. A member of your family. According to the information we have received, her father, Ibrahim Efendi, died a month ago, and his wife, as well as his sons, Hussein and Omer, his daughter, Hasibe or Nesibe, about whom we know nothing, and another son, Shehabitin, were at one time living in Izmit and at another in Istanbul, where they are apparently dwelling unhappily under the roof of Hassan Efendi. Who that is, I don't know. It would seem that the poor mother is distressed because she misses her daughter. Tell her not to worry and to be patient. Her daughter is alive. In fact, for the last seven years, she has been my first wife and the mother of my second daughter, Jelile, who is now three years old. She will soon give birth to another child. She is much concerned with the fate of her mother, her father, and her brothers and sisters. Naturally, I share her concerns. 
I believe that both these texts give a fleeting but very poignant uh, sense of the tragedies that lie behind each of these fragmented and scattered lives. Handed over from one household to another, following their masters throughout the empire, cut off from any kind of contact with their family, their livelihood and fate depended on the will of men who could not be bothered with the details of their past life and of their true identity. Perhaps the most striking document I have ever encountered in this respect, which I dug out from the Topkapı Palace archives, is a letter written by Murad's first wife to her mother-in-law, Murad's mother. So from a slave wife to a slave mother about her name. To grasp the meaning of this short letter, one needs to know that when a slave entered the harem, she was given a new name, generally of poetic resonance, resonance, to replace the properly Muslim name she had been given at birth. The letter was about this woman having managed to convince her master, Murad, to abandon her slave name, Elaru, and to revert to her true name, Mevhibe. So I'm quoting from this letter, and this is the letter from Elaru turned into Mefibet to her mother-in-law, Chef, uh, Chef Kevza. Our Lord, Murad, has changed my name from Elaru to Mefibet. For over 20 years, for whatever reason, these men never thought of that name and gave me whatever name came to their mind. But thank God, upon, upon my repeated requests, my Lord finally changed it. But my position has not changed. I am still your slave as you knew me. I would be as ashamed of changing my position as I have been ashamed of my old name. I hope my words will be properly understood, and I beg of your highness that you no longer call me by that filthy name. I believe that no words could describe better the frustration that this common practice caused probably to scores of women who were suddenly deprived of their identity, of their last remaining tie to their childhood and family, and found themselves thrown into an exile of a kind none of the proud political victims of banishment, uh, male, of course, could ever uh, imagine. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Aldam Diyaratem, for this wonderful talk that, in fact, brings so many of the uh, points uh, of the conference together. Um, I will make it, uh, keep it very short, because I think there will be many questions, actually, from the audience. So um, the strategy that we will follow is, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and um, uh, our colleagues uh, from the SPI 25 um, venue will come to you with a microphone. So please raise your hand. I will, uh, I will point to you. Someone will come with the microphone. And uh, if possible, I would like to ask you to keep your questions sh as short as possible and to the point. So thank you very much. Okay. So yeah, you should raise it. You should raise it high. Okay. So questions. I already see Isa, so over there. Thank you very much. What a wonderful uh, way to. Uh, thank you very much. What a wonderful way to um, emphasize the significance and con continuous importance of these themes that extend back hundreds of years and will continue on um, tomorrow in our newspapers. And um, I share your lament and frustrations, um, but there, there are um, spaces of hope for us to try to resurrect the stories of even those people who are downtrodden and find themselves, even if it, it, it re results in an extenuation of maybe multiple generations of stories told from one to the next, passed on, but in the case of Anatolia and Turkey, many of those who came from the Balkans have indeed shared uh, to 
descendants, the stories. And they have, of course, been somewhat tainted by, um, by time. But I know for a fact that amongst Albanian and Bosniak um, um, migrant families, um, there have been attempts at various points in time to resurrect the stories of one or both of the kind of um, members of families who did originally originated from the Balkans. And there have been, um, over the last 10, 20 years, attempts to encourage this resurrection of stories that for a long periods of time were, of course, suppressed. One very interesting point, but maybe those of you who are leading students with potential projects of this kind, one of my students in, I was in exile in Atlanta for a long time, actually looked at websites, Facebook uh, chat groups of, path, of peoples who know of their origins and looking for stories to resurrect using pictures, using family uh, letters from grandmother before she dies. These kinds of things can be very rich and, and, and interesting for those of us who want to try to resurrect these stories, granted, from mostly of the 20th century, but perhaps even earlier. Lastly, uh, your incredible list, very, very uh, thorough. We do need to remember, however, the important impact of those economic refugees, hundreds of thousands who ended up in Latin America, in North American cities, in Southeast Asia, who have enormous contributions to make to the 20th century stories, building the cities of the Americas, and they have a very interesting imprint on Ottoman, the Ottoman story and the Turkish story as well, if we maybe geographically think more broadly than what Anatolia constitutes today as the Turkish story. So thank you very much, but not all is lost. I think we have plenty of space to discover these stories of exile from many parts of the world. Thank you very much again. Well, thank you. I mean, an excellent question, as they always say, uh, but it wasn't really a question, and you're right. Uh, I've, I've ventured into a domain which is not mine, which is that of talking about the living. I'm, I'm very happy with the dead. Uh, I don't like the living. Uh, but uh, my observation is very intuitive, and I think I said that. I think there is a correlation between the level of wealth and possession at departure uh, and the capacity to transmit the memories, a concrete memory of what is lost. And my impression is that the bulk of the quote-unquote Turkish refugees from the Balkans belong to a lower status than the Greeks who came, who were more urban uh, or semi-urban uh, or maybe wealthier. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I see that, for example, the Cretans, the Cretan Muslims, are uh, somehow different. But then again, it's intuitive. Uh, I'm, I'm not really insisting on, on this, but it, it seems to be um, the, the, the case. Is, uh, what, and of course, there's something else which I I tried to mention the fact that memory has to be mediated by some kind either of a moral force or of a scholarly force. I mean, uh, what the, um, the Institute for Anatolian Studies in Athens has done ever since the 1930s is incredible. I mean, this is something, when I listened to Artemis uh, Papatheodoulou's uh, talk, I wonder to what extent, because you have Greeks looking at ruins in the 1890s already. I mean, uh, but it seems that after 1922, it triggers, and there is probably the, the exile itself, and then the, the expectation from the receiving, on the uh, receiving end, that uh, forces people to think more about their heritage and whatever. So it's such a complex equation uh, that, you know, that's why I, I like mine dead and buried, prefer preferably, and uh, I like to work on paper uh, rather than voices, but, you know, that's... There's a question in the back, I think. Yes. Um... So a question over there in the back, yeah, and then one more over here. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, and I have a, a question which really connects to the previous one. Um, I happen to know some Greek friends on Facebook who really, they're very nationalists, and they think of, sometimes they think of regaining, let's call it that way, uh, Byzantium and even Izmir. So maybe that's why some of the, uh, let's say, um, uh, urbanized Greek 
still have this right about uh, Turkey as if it's still theirs and will be theirs back in the future, almost restoring the Byz Byzantine Empire. I, I know because I talk to people who think, think like this. So maybe that's the difference. And, and while in Turkey, maybe it might Let be... Let them try. Let them try. No, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> more seriously, what is more pathetic? Yeah, it's Greeks, pathetic. Yes. Greeks dreaming of reconquering Anatolia yeah. or Turks dreaming of reconquering Istanbul? But maybe, yeah, okay. But maybe in Turkey, the idea of regaining the Balkans have been giving up. So that's why it's not an interesting, not much a topic uh, among the writers. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but that's why I ask you. Yeah. No, uh, uh, that's why I insisted on Istanbul. I mean, the big deal in Istanbul is to commemorate constantly a city that we, the nation, uh, whatever continuity there might be, has conquered six centuries ago or five centuries ago. That is even sicker than uh, the Greek dreams. I mean, so when you start talking about these popular uh, things, and of course, there too, it's in direct relation with what politicians are doing. I mean, when Turkey is uh, engaging in some kind of an adventure in the Eastern Mediterranean basin or in Libya, the political elite will start showering you with uh, themes of, uh, of revenge for the loss of Tripolitania or what. So it's, it's and, and, and for a historian, it, it, at some point, until I became a sociologist, it was interesting. And now I'm sick and tired of this because it, it is really very disturbing. But yes, I, I, you, you are absolutely right. And there are differences in, in perception, I think. But it's also contextual and circumstantial. It can change in very uh, different ways. I mean, uh, the Greek obsession with the Hagia Sophia is... You know, it's it's a classic. I mean, down to postcards with the the minarets having been uh, snipped. Um, so you know, uh, but then again, look at the way in which the museum of the Hagia Sophia was converted into a mosque, as if we were reconquering the city. So you know. Just uh, one sec. One, uh, just let's start with one, and then. I have a few questions. Where did you learn your English? That's a personal question. Sorry for asking. You don't need to. In exile. <laughs> no, really? I, I, no. As I said at the beginning, I'm a dip brat. I'm a diplomat's kid. Okay. So when you travel abroad, you know, you end up picking up languages. Okay. So my main question is about uh, demographical uh, question. Can you comment anything about demographical question nowadays in Istanbul? And in uh, Turkey in general. Demographical question, I mean, uh, is it the target to go that uh, it's, uh, you need more children basically or less children to cut it very short? Okay, uh, if, you, if you listen to Erdogan, we should be making three. Uh, my personal, I, I, I mean the extinction, the, the half extinction of the human race would, uh, would be an ideal solution if you ask me. Uh, that's my personal view. Uh, but uh, apparently, by demographic standards, Turkey has almost reached stagnation. Yeah, because Istanbul, 15 million. Yeah, but I mean, it's not increasing anymore. No, it has reached, I'm not a demographer, but you know, uh, but it apparently, those people who know <laughs> demography uh, tell us that there is an, a, an aging of the Turkish population. So we are slowly coming to where Europe is, that is losing the, if on top of that, uh, two thirds of our youth decides to emigrate, uh, that's gonna be a catastrophe. I mean, uh, obviously, I, I think that I'm, I'm not a natalist at all, on the contrary, but I think that what, what really is important is the quality and the balance of the population you're, you're left with and losing the young population, and it's not just any young population. You're talking about educated or people in, it's, it's a disaster. Uh, it could be a disaster. The good thing, well, the, the good thing is that it's not easy to leave Turkey or to enter the places where you want to go. Yeah. Just yesterday. Just, sorry, don't. Uh, 
Uh, so following question. Just yesterday I was talking occasionally with a Turkish businessman here in the Netherlands, living based uh, and trading all over the world spices. And uh, he mentioned uh, his personal opinion that uh, Turkey is the cheapest country to uh, sort of to eat, uh, oh. to go out, uh, to drink a cup of coffee, the cheapest. If you earn your money in Europe, yes. <laughs> it's not for Turks anymore. But uh, is it still such an economical level uh, for uh, daily life is very low, eh? Yes, I mean, it's cheap by, I mean, the euro, which uh, two years ago was at five or six, is now at 12. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, that's just zeros. I mean, it's just, you know, it's cosmetic. Uh, but there was a, st a stabilization of the Turkish lira. The Turkish lira, when, uh, when the, um, uh, in, in 2000 and something, when they dropped the zeros, there was almost some kind of a parity between the lira and the dollar. And now the dollar is at 10. So. Yeah. Okay, there was another question in the back. Sure. Um, so I want to build on the earlier question on Greek nationalism and Greek refugeehood. Um, the seemingly improbable heights that Turkish nationalism year after year is able to climb of uh, the past decade, maybe for longer. Do you see any connection between that and the fact that Turkey um, is a nation of refugees, of the descendants of refugees, and all these narratives and family histories and fictions of and maybe a fear of displacement has been going around for the past century. It is possible. I mean, you're being kind. You're, you're trying to find some kind of an excuse for xenophobia, for racism. Uh, and it is true that descendants, I mean, you said it, uh, right? Uh, no, who said it? Uh, during uh, the last session, it was said, and it's true that people who have been displaced become displacers, right? Uh, it, it's it's a well known uh, it's a well known phenomenon. Uh, but then again, I don't think you can explain, uh, especially today. Uh, the attitude of the Turkish majority regarding others only through that. I mean, yes, I think that in the 1920s, 1930s, Kemalism was made by people who were displaced during the war, during the defeats, and therefore, yes, there's a, there's a taste of that in the way in which... But I don't think you can uh, still explain it uh, through uh, only uh, that kind of an atavistic uh, uh, reaction. But then again, it's sociology, you know. <laughs> There's another question here from Darina. Yeah. Thank you. I would like to ask you to, to think about the remembering and forgetting of past, because I know it's complicated and it's complicated when we talk about Turkey, a country that, that has been insisting on forgetting that some people should forget what happened, and me living in a, and working in a country where the winners of a civil war also insist that we should forget that and move, and whoever wants to think about past should st sort of is, uh, st should stop thinking about it. And, but at the same time, there is also this fetishization of memory, and which is connected to nationalism, which is connected to exclu exclusion, which is connected to always justifying policy through references to the past, who was here first, who, was, who came later, and this, is, this can also blow. So how do you think, like, uh, this is not, yeah, like, how to manage the remembering and how to manage the forgetting? What is your opinion about that? I mean, remembering and forgetting at an individual or communal level is a very complex uh, process. But what makes it, but that makes it interesting, right? I mean, for students of history uh, or of sociology. Uh, but... The problem is when this is instrumentalized by, say, political manipulation. So my, ideally, I would say that history shouldn't be taught in Turkey, 
You know, I mean, uh, my, my idea is that what makes the beauty of history is that it may not be of use. Like caviar, you know, it's a luxury. It can be useful for certain things. It's an intellectual, artistic, literary curiosity. It's, it's about curiosity. It's about asking questions, not finding answers. Whereas the way politicians look at history, it's always for, you know, finding answers. And the answers, there's no surprise, are their concerns, their ideological or political uh, goals. So as long as you cannot separate the political from the memorial, the memorial, uh, we're in deep trouble, right? So I, I don't find, because otherwise, I, I don't have a problem with the fact that memory can be complicated, conflicting, or invented. That, that's not the problem. Even, you know, the mythology of, say, the invention of the Hittites as the ancestors of the Turks, it, it is interesting today because at least it's not part of the ideological discourse. So it's been neutralized on that side. You, you can study it as a curiosity and look at the dynamics behind it. But for communities and individuals about their own past, it is so biased and so, you know, I mean, we talked so much about slaves. Uh, and by the way, uh, what you said about the Circassians inventing their nobility, that's not true. They do have a nobility. They have, and that's what makes it interesting because the problem is not that they don't, it's that the men who are buying them, integrating them into the, the harem, have absolutely no interest in whatever social structure they come from. But they, in the harem, are using the hierarchies of the adiges and the ubuch and whatever to establish the hierarchy uh, in, in the in the harem. And that is one of the major problems because we have no access to that other than oral sources, and most of the oral sources are dead. So we're left with very vague notions of, of the, so that's one problem of remembering. And of course, then you have the second level, which is total invention. I mean, it's, uh, fascinating how in Turkey any woman who's interviewed on TV and wants to brag about her beauty will say, oh, I'm either from Rumelia or from Circassia. It becomes suddenly very chic. Why? Because it is racially positive and positive through the sexualization of slavery in, in the 19th century. And that is not at all a problem for them, but they would never say, oh, I come from the Yemen or from uh, Syria or whatever. It's a very white vision of blonde, blue eyes. It's, it's incredible. That, that's why, if you look at all the fantasies that are created around Atatürk and his identity, it's all based on his being blonde, blue-eyed, and whatever. He's, he's white. He's white. He's European. He's civilized. And that's exactly what his opponents are using to say that he is a dunme, he is a whatever. You know, it's, so all these constructs are horribly vitiated and, and uh, contaminated by so much ideology that it's very difficult to get to the roots of what really is being remembered because most of it is not remembered but invented. But again, you know. Okay, there's one more question here from Ur. Thank you so much for your great presentation. Um, you made an interesting point, I mean interesting points, but one about the lexicon of the word exile. Um, when you talked about Arabic words and Turkish words, surgun, which brought to my mind actually the relationship between um, death, which you are also interested in as a subject, and migration. If you think about, for instance, irtihal, uh, the word to mean uh, to die, but related to the, I mean, the root is about a journey. Right, right. Yes, yes, And if, if you think about the Arabic word, right? And if you think about the modern Turkish word, göçmek, it could mean just to migrate but to die as well. So I'm wondering what this close relationship between death and migration uh, tells us. And related to this, um, you also referred to something, some kind of a difference between the way 
exile or being displaced is imagined by Greeks and Turks, especially the population exchange, how Greeks know very intimately about the lands they hailed from. On the other hand, Turks, not really. Um, which also brings to my mind, maybe it's a little bit of a stretch, but maybe not. Um, so, um, if we think about the relation between death and migration, uh, when you migrate and when you die, you go to the eternal life, right? So it could be heaven, it could be hell. So in, if we take it as a case of migration, physical migration, then you are in that thinking, maybe you are back in heaven, which is Turkey, and which brings to mind this song, Turkiyam, Turkiyam, Cennetim, right? Cennet vatan, all these kind of like connotations with heaven. Of course, it is arguable, maybe it is hell for some. I mean, it's afterlife, but it's permanent. So I'm wondering what you, I mean, if you have any okay. thoughts on uh, this. Yes, the uh, death as a, as a voyage, as a trip, as uh, an exile, I don't think the Turks are the only ones to use that metaphor. You know, it's all over the place. I think it's part and parcel of human understanding or not understanding death. And therefore, you always have some kind of a translation of the body or the soul into another world. Uh, so I, I, I think we shouldn't fall into the trap of finding specificities where there is some kind of a universal generality. But then again, yes, uh, it's true that in Turkish, both in Turkish Turkish or in Arabic Turkish, Ruhlet, uh, uh Irtihal, they're all related. And you talk about Darbeka, so it's the place, the abode of, so there's a, like a physical, and this is, you know, part and parcel of the eschatology of, of Islam, as far as I, I know. Uh, so I, I think it's kind of normal, but I wouldn't, I, I mean, it's, I like words, and I like playing with words, I like trying to see how words evolve in time and what, but I'm also very cautious of coming to conclusions about uh, what they may really mean because it doesn't necessarily work as we would like it to, to work as a philologist or a historian slash philologist. So while, yes, I, I agree that there is something interesting there, um, I would be wary of... of shortcuts, um, not to say that you are, but you know, your proposition is interesting. And again, <laughs> this is my, my, my theory of history. It's not about answers, it's about questions. So your question is absolutely legitimate and I'd love to develop that question as long as I don't have to give an answer. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, yeah. Okay, we have room for one final question. I already saw Roy, so please go ahead. Um, well, thank uh, one question, if I may. Uh, can you tell us what happened? Uh, can you move the mic away so it won't uh, shut up? Uh, what happened to the million and a half uh, Circassians um, and uh, Bosniaks who came and settled in what came to be modern Turkey? What is their social status? Have they been assimilated into the Turk military or do they still stand as a uh, recognized uh, social group? Yes, pretty much. Now, first of all, they didn't all settle in Anatolia. There's quite a number who settled in places like Jordan, you know, in Syria, in Iraq, uh, the Chechens, for example, in the 1860s and whatever. So it's not just Turkey as we have it today. But yes, today in Turkey, uh, being of Circassian origin, whatever that means, because it's very generic and, it, you know, uh, it's a positive connotation, one you would more or less brag about. But then again, there are more, uh, let's say, focused groups who are really interested in the culture, uh, not just, you know, calling oneself a, a Circassian, and even some people who talk about the Circassian genocide committed by the Ottomans and especially by the Turkish Republic. 
uh, because of the uh, the dissensions among the, uh, the the fighting groups during the War of Independence. So, depending on where you stand in that wide spectrum, you have probably a majority of people who claim to be of Circassian descent out of the blue maybe, or with very little evidence and who are very happy with that because it gives them a positive kind of uh, uh, racial connotation. And then at the other edge, you might have people who will uh, have a political claim about the rights of the Circassians which have not been respected by the Republic and therefore see this as a legitimate political uh, fight. Again, this is really, and I'm not saying it with, it's sociology. I mean, I, 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 I'm really not aware of the numbers of the proportions of it, but yeah, uh, that's it. But otherwise, the Circassian immigration into Anatolia had one major target, which is that of continuing to provide the palace with slaves, with slave women. So, and what is interesting, and this is something that was a uh, part of my presentation, these women are Muslims. I mean, you can question the degree of orthodoxy or whatever, but you're talking about the enslavement of Muslims, which by Quranic, Islamic, whatever standards is a no-no. So this story of Mevhibe, who becomes Elaru and returns to Mevhibe, it's very interesting from the perspective of slavery, understanding the dynamics and the frustrations of, of losing her identity. But it's also a revelation that this woman was a Muslim at the beginning, and she was enslaved as, well, she wasn't enslaved, she was processed as a slave by a culture an immigration for whom slavery, especially at an imperial level, was a very decent option of social promotion. Uh, at least for the, uh, for the, uh, for the others, uh, the woman went to the, the palace. And, you know. Thank you so much, uh, Etam, for this uh, wonderful talk. And Thank you for so generously addressing uh, all the questions from the audience. Thank you so much for the, all of those of you who were here and attended. Also for those of you who uh, watched the live stream at home. Um, we have another keynote uh, tomorrow, which uh, will be uh, also screened um, online. If you'd like to follow that one as well, by Christine Filiou of the University of Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley, then uh, please visit www.turkeystudies.com. Um, network.org. There you will find all the information. And for all of you who are here, let's please continue the conversation off stage. And uh, thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.